Once again, welcome everyone. Today we have a fantastic guest speaker who I will introduce in a few minutes. We'll be talking a lot about the coolest uh, research um, she's doing right now. Um, we saw uh, an article last week. I briefly introduced it one of our latest uh, publications. It's actually on Med Archive, I think. I don't know if it's uh, what it is, uh, but we'll talk about it in a second. And um, you can see my screen. Yes, it is. Great. All right. So let's spend 10 seconds for to mute your mic, camera on, add pronouns to your name if you didn't do it yet. How do you do it? Participants, select your name and rename, please. Some of you were just a few minutes ago with me in the Majors Forum. We had a really fun time and the Majors Forum was recorded. We're gonna post online the, the link to the video recording. So if you didn't have a chance to participate in the Majors Forum, you can still watch the actual recording. And here we are. I'm super excited about having Stephanie uh, here uh, today in class. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate. Um, I mean, super cool uh, articles. I was just checking. I mean, I couldn't fit your 2020 list of articles into one screenshot. <laughs> like, how do I do this? So it's it's amazing. I'm gonna. I made you co-host, co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Um, so right now, let's see if it works. Let me know if it works. And I'm also gonna make co-hosts. Yes, the other TAs. Can you share your screen? Yes, welcome, welcome. Great. Ready when you're ready. Lovely. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and yes, 2020 has been uh, luckily a productive year in terms of papers. Um, just briefly about myself, I did my PhD in London, did a couple of postdocs in London, and have recently and very timely, just before lockdown, moved to France um, <laughs> to take up a position with the CNRS. Um, and that's, that's the, the trajectory in terms of what I'm interested in, what I'm working with. Um, I basically have spent the last 15 years working with a method called uh, diffusion imaging tractography. Um, and those are the colorful bundles that you see on the screen at the moment. And I'm gonna talk about that method um, a lot. Um, applied to language sciences and aphasia mainly for the last uh, 15 years. And I'm slowly moving on to other um, disorders and uh, cognitive uh, measures as well. So that's a brief uh, summary about me. Um, I usually do very interactive lectures. So if you have a question, if you don't understand something I'm saying, if I'm going too fast, um, please do feel free to interrupt and, and ask a question for clarification or further um, explanation. Um, just say that I was asked to give an overview of everything <laughs> in 30 minutes, which um, is slightly tricky. So there will be parts where I'm rushing through, um, also being probably slightly ignorant to what you know and you don't know at this stage. So please do stop me. Um, generally, the parts that I keep very short, we have a YouTube channel where you find basically one talk per every lecture, uh, per every slide that I show you. So if you really, really love the subject, you can dive really deep. Um, on that channel and I'll give you the link later on on this list as well. Right, without further ado, um, what we're looking at, I want to just make this point very clear before we do anything else, is one of the most complex structures in the universe. So what I'm putting side by side here is a brain cell and a picture of the universe. So we are studying a very complex subject and you're not supposed to just grasp it all. To be fair, most people who spend decades in that field don't grasp it all. Um, so don't get overwhelmed. I'm just highlighting a few bits and pieces. Um, and then you, your job is to piece it together for yourself. Now, the brain is very complex. So how did we start learning about what the structures are doing and how the brain works? 
Well, the first clues came from famous cases. And here are some of the most famous cases in neurosciences that you may or may not have come across already. Um, so on the left, we see Phineas Gage, who is probably the most spectacular famous case, who um, was uh, a railroad worker putting down the tracks in the States back in the days. Uh, and one day things went wrong and he had this iron rod that he's holding in his hand go through his head, uh, skull and brain. It landed a couple of feet uh, away from him and he was fine more or less, surprisingly. Um, he survived, he uh, could articulate, he could speak, but um, reports say that his personality has changed afterwards. So this is the first famous case that roughly located personality into the frontal lobe. Then the second famous case is Louis-Victor Lebrun, better known as patient Tom. And that was a patient described by a Paul Broca and you see a better picture of the brain later on as well. But you have the original specimen in the jar on the top in the middle. Um, and that is a patient who suffered um, a lesion to the inferior frontal lobe. And he couldn't articulate anymore. And that's why he got nicknamed patient Tom, because that was the only syllable that he was still able to articulate. And then we have patient HM, as he is known on the right, who had a bilateral temporal lobe surgery and he lost his memory. So here are the three famous cases that placed um, personality in the frontal lobe, language articulation in the frontal lobe and memory in the temporal lobe. So in terms of language, the, the famous cases, um, again, you see Paul Broca's patient on the top left and you nicely see that even if your anatomy isn't up to, up to standards at this point, you can definitely see that there's a part on the left side that doesn't look quite as healthy as the rest of the brain. And this is exactly where the lesion was located. And um, as I already said, that patient could only articulate one syllable. Now, this is kind of the first seminal case that placed language articulation into the frontal lobe. But Karl Wernicke, another neurologist, um, said, yes, I, I do agree. I do see those patients with a lesion in roughly that part of the brain and articulation problems. But I also see other patients who have a lesion in the posterior temporal lobe, and they present with language deficits, but different flavors. So those patients could articulate. They were completely fluent, but they couldn't understand what people told them. And what they said, even though they were fluent, didn't make much sense. So he proposed the first model of language whereby you have two areas, one in the frontal, one in the temporal lobe, that were later known as Broca's and Wernicke's area. And those two areas he hypothesized to be connected by the psychic arc or archaeid fasciculus. Now, about 11 years later, Ludwig Lichtheim said, this is all great. We have a center for motor speech output. We have a center for auditory language comprehension, but there has to be another part somewhere in the brain where we store the concepts of what things are. So he introduced another um, part of the model, and that's why we call it the house of language, because he drew the house and he didn't place his area anywhere in the brain. So at this point, we have um, Broca's aphasia, we have Wernicke's aphasia, and then in the Lichtheim model, he added two more aphasias, which are the uh, transmodal motor and sensory aphasias. Now, uh, later, the um, American uh, neurologist Norman Geschwind kind of brought those three streams together in one model and he placed it back into the brain. So now you see on the bottom right that we have um, Broca's area in the inferior frontal lobe. We have Wernicke's area in the posterior temporal um, lobe. Those two are connected, indicated by those dotted lines, and they go through area A in this image, which is the angular gyrus in the inferior frontal, uh, sorry, inferior parietal 
No. Um, so this is the working model of language that we had for a very, very long time until now. So if we look at how we reached those models, I already said that Broca, for example, looked at the patient and he placed, he basically connected the deficit with a part of the brain that was damaged. So what I want to show you here is a, a little thought experiment. So we have four patients, they all have a lesion um, and roughly a similar part of the brain and they all present with a neurological deficit for argument's sake of this lecture they have a type of aphasia. Now, what we would do in the clinic is we take those pictures and then we draw around the lesions and we put them on top of each other. Now, when you do that, you can see that all these patients, even though they have slightly different lesions, they all overlap in the brain area B. So in this model, we would then assume that the area B in the brain if it's damaged, causes the deficit that we observe. This is the classical lesion model um, approach, also known as topological approach or localizationism. And as I said before, there's a two hour lecture on YouTube if you want to dive into this. Now I'm going to come back to the slide later on. Um, but as I said, the idea here is you overlap all the patients, they have a lesion in area B, you ignore the other areas that are also damaged by some, but not all patients, and you assume that area B is important for the deficit. So how can we study lesions in the brain? So here's a couple of uh, methods that I put together for you that show you how we can study the brain in health and in disease. Now, the first one on the top, uh, Klingler dissections, that's a post-mortem method where you um, look at the connections of the brain, obviously highly invasive because it's post-mortem. Same for histological staining and axonal tracing. Then we have methods that are less invasive like MEG and EEG where you place electrodes on the skull and you can record the signal from brain areas underneath this um, TMS, which um, I don't know if you guys ever tried it. <laughs> we played around with it a little bit. So you place a coil on your skull and you basically just sap the brain. And if you get the right area, your, your fingers jump or your leg, um, or you induce um, some language errors like speech arrest or paraphrasia. Then there is direct uh, electrical cortical stimulation, which again is highly invasive. This is done in patients who have a tumor that is close to language areas. Uh, those patients are woken up during surgery and the surgeon stimulates parts of the brain and asks the patient to um, name or repeat words to make sure that they're not cutting out any eloquent, as it's called, um, brain regions. And then there's MRI. And you have three examples here because MRI is a very versatile method that you can use to, depending on which sequence you, you um, select, you can use to study many, many things. Now, broadly speaking, you can separate them into two categories. One is to look at the function of the brain and one is to look at the structure of the brain. Now, you can see that I sliced through MRI because it's so versatile, you can actually do both. So why do we have so many methods? What's the difference between them? What you see here is on the x-axis, you see the sensitivity in terms of time of the method. So we have a range from milliseconds all the way down to the month. And then on the y-axis, you see how good our spatial resolution is, as in we can either uh, image the entire brain or we can go down to the level of synapses. Now, two things I want to highlight here. One is if you look at the little inlay from 1988, you see that we keep adding new methods across the spectrum. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is that brain lesions is tucked away at that little top right corner. And you can see that we have various uh, spatial definitions for brain lesions, depending on how we assess them. But also the time frame varies from, in this graph, days to month, but we are actually within minutes to month. 
And why is that? I want to show you um, an example. So what you see here is um, the first uh, image A is a stroke patient and B is a tumor patient, both presented with a type of aphasia. And they went through clinical and research imaging assessments. So what you see uh, on the top left is a classical CT scan, for example, then a structural and a, a pathological MRI scan, followed by a perfusion scan and two different types of diffusion scans. And then the same for the tumor patient in panel B. Now I'm showing you this because depending on which type of sequence you use and method you use in that case, it's easier or harder to identify where the lesion is. So when you look at the CT scan, for example, you can barely see that there is a lesion in the frontal lobe as well. But when you look at the structural and especially the um, pathological T2 scan, you can now see that there's a white blob. When you look at the perfusion, it's very obvious. So the point that I'm making here is that depending on the contrast you use, it's easier or harder to identify a lesion. And that is particularly important when you see patients who have so-called hidden lesions. So when you look at a structural scan, they present, they come into the clinic, they present with a language deficit. You do a structural scan, there is no lesion. Now, if you use a different type of scan, for example, a perfusion scan or a PET scan, you might be able to identify a lesion that doesn't yet show up on a structural scan. Now, why is there such a huge difference in terms of the time resolution and the spatial resolution? That is because every one of these methods images something slightly different. So when we look at the beautiful tractography reconstructions, for example, we're looking deep into the white matter of the brain, so underneath the cortex. When we look at bold functional imaging, we look only at the cortex and the changes within. Direct cortical stimulation, you place the electrode directly onto the surface of the brain. TMS is even outside the skull. And that's why we get such a huge difference in our sequences and different reasons. <clears throat> so how can we study uh, anatomy of the brain and in particular language in the brain. So we can look at the surface anatomy of the brain, which is basically what Broca did, just looked at the entire brain and said, no, oh, doesn't look good, probably the, the cause of the issue here. We can slice through the brain and look at subcortical structures, like the thalamus, for example. We can use tractography to look at the connections between brain regions. And we can watch the brain at work, basically, um, by doing functional imaging. Now, that could be either a task or a resting state, um, but you basically see the brain working. Now, these different types of uh, modalities can give you different information. And for this lecture today, I want to focus on connectional anatomy. When we look at the connections in the brain, there's, broadly speaking, three groups. The first is association fibers. These are defined by connecting different parts within the same hemisphere. There are commissure fibers that connect uh, the two hemispheres together. And then there is projection fibers that connect the brain to the periphery. Now this classification goes back to Theodore Minard in the 19th century and basically what tractography uh, imaging has added to this classification is color. <laughs> so now we um, use the so-called RGB scheme, which I always, for years, I thought this is like a fancy, fancy scheme. RGB just means red, green, and blue. Um, so by definition, association pathways are shown in green, commissure pathways are shown in red, and projection pathways are shown in blue. Now, when we uh, process our data, you actually get them all together. And when you look at the entirety of the white matter, that is now they known as the tractogram. Now, from this tractogram, where you have all the white matter in one big bulge of bundles, basically, you can segment out individual tracts and then study 
the um, contribution to different functions or pathologies um, in different disorders for each and every individual tract. So coming back to the model that we had before, so here I'm showing you exactly the same four patients. They still present with the same neurological deficit. We still have the same brain regions, A, B, and C. The only thing we're changing now is that we assume that area A and C are interconnected by a white matter pathway. Now, if we plot our lesions again, again, same lesions, they all damage area B. But now what we can see is that they also damage the connection between A and C. So by just changing the framework from a localizationist approach to a pathological approach, the conclusion now is very different. So now we would assume that the neurological deficit that the patients present with is not due to the lesion uh, area B, but to the disconnection between area A and C. So if we apply this uh, logic to the famous cases, go back to Broca. This is Broca's uh, patient's brain classical localizationist approach, topological approach, one part of the brain is damaged, leads to a deficit, i.e. that part of the brain has to be relevant for that deficit. Now, Nina Drakis a couple of years ago, uh, was very lucky and had the chance to actually come to Paris and scan that very brain that is preserved completely in a jar. And she put the brain in a diaper and stuck it in an MRI scanner. And what she showed us is that the damage actually extended far beyond just the superficial cortical area deep into the white matter. So if we had had a different framework or different methods, we may not have Broca's area these days, but Broca's fasciculus. I want to introduce you to another famous case, uh, and that's a famous case that isn't as famous as the others. Uh, simply because he didn't have a deficit, but he's used or was used as the um, template brain. So in order to do the lesion overlay that I explained to you, we need to bring all our brains into the same kind of space. So we need to assume that we're all the same in order to stack up our brain lesions. And this was really one of the first um, templates that was available. And any imaging software you open today will have Colin, one version of Colin's brain in there as a template. Now, that was a great idea, but what this method doesn't consider is variability. So you can think about it um, similar to faces, for example. We all have a face, same features, eyes, nose, mouth but we all look slightly different. And that is something that we don't account for as much in neurosciences at the moment. So I'm just gonna show you some examples for the primary areas of the brain. So we have the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, and the motor strip here. And you can see that between uh, individual people, but also within the left and the right hemisphere, there's quite a degree of variability now, that's not only for primary areas, we also have the same for association areas. Here's an example of the parasingulate circus that is present in about half of the population. But even in that half, it isn't necessarily present in both hemispheres. So there's a huge degree of variability. A couple of years ago, we tried to measure that degree of variability um, by simply um, checking how far we need to stretch a brain to fit the template. And the more you need to stretch it, the more variable you are. And what you see here is the map at the group level. And we can see that, for example, the visual area or the um, frontal lobe, the medial frontal lobe, have hotspots of variability, whereas other parts of the brain are less variable. Now, the most exciting thing about this paper is not that we show the variability of the gray matter, but that we showed the first ever map of the variability of the white matter 
So what you see here is the same image I showed you before with the tractogram, but now you can see on that very tractogram the variability, how much you need to deform each brain. And what you can appreciate here is that there's a gradient. The white matter at the core of the brain is less variable, and the more lateral you come, the more variability you can see in the white matter. The second interesting point is that it's not only the more lateral, but particularly those areas that we ascribe to being important for um, higher cognitive functions, including language, are more variable than other parts of the brain. So the question that arises is, does this variability mean something? Do you get an advantage or a disadvantage by being more or less variable? And there's a few pointers here. So the first study looked at healthy volunteers uh, and they asked healthy volunteers to learn to juggle. Anyone of you who can do that or had to learn it knows how hard it can be. Um, and they looked at the changes in the white matter and were able to show that experience is modifying the white matter. Another study just underneath was done uh, in my group in London, where they looked at just a priori, what is the anatomy without any behavioral manipulation. And we were able to show that there seems to be three groups when you map the archive for cyclists with tractography. And that is in group one that you can track the archive in the left hemisphere without any issues. But in the right hemisphere, we weren't able to trace it. And then group two and three, you could trace it in the right hemisphere, but to a different degree. Um, now, we then asked those volunteers to perform a verbal learning task and could show that group three, so the more bilateral group, outperformed group one and two. So there seems to be an advantage if you are more bilateral. I then took that to the clinic and tested stroke and neurodegenerative patients. And I'm not going to go into detail here because I'm going to come back to those studies in more detail in a minute. But before we do that, I want to just stress one more point. So what you see here is our current understanding of the visual system in the brain and the auditory system in the brain. Those two systems have been mainly mapped in animal models. And you can see the, the brain areas and boxes and the connections as a wire diagram, hugely complex. Now, when we look at language, we get quite a different picture, which is this one. So <laughs> I may argue that maybe this is too simplistic, given how complex language is. And indeed, when you start looking into the individual anatomical areas, in Broca's and Manica's area, for example, but also the linguistic uh, functions that we perform. Indeed, it seems that these models, uh, that classical model of Broca, Wernicke and the Archaeid in the middle, uh, may not be the entire story. So here is examples of current language models that we have. They're clearly more complex than the model that I just showed you. Um, but again, I'm not going to go into detail with all of them. You can, you can read the papers and watch the talks online. Um, but they come from very different schools. So the first model comes from psychiatry. The second model B here applies the where and what pathway idea from the visual literature to language. Then model C, um, one of my favorites, comes from neurosurgery. Um, the only one that doesn't have a brain quite telling, I think. And then model D, um, again, a personal favorite just because it has the London tube map in it. Um, but what you need to know about these models is that even though they look very different and they come from different schools, they do overlap. So some of the connections and areas you find in all the models, some of them are individual to one model. And that could, for example, be due to having a different framework as I've just shown you. So the language network, 
classically, as I said, it's Broca's area in the frontal lobe, Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe, and the connection uh, as the arcuate in between those two. In 2005, Marco Cotani uh, segmented further parts of the arcuate. So instead of just having that direct connection between the frontal and temporal, he also was able to identify an indirect pathway that is composed of the anterior and the posterior segment. And you can see they come together in the inferior parietal lobe, which was already described by Norman Geschwind, if you remember the area A for the angular gyrus. Now, since then, we've been busy mapping the language network, um, and others have too. So now it's a bit more uh, tracked these days. Um, some of them have been consistently shown to be important for language. Others are suspected to be important for language, and all of them are currently still being tested. But just to give you an idea that this is a very evolving uh, field at the moment. Right, so I said I'm going to come back to those two studies that I promised you a minute ago. So the first one uh, is the stroke study. Both of them have the arcuate fasciculus and the three segments at the core. So this study I already showed you, it was done in healthy controls. We were able to map three different groups. Interestingly, if you split the groups by sex, there's a sex difference whereby women tend to be equally distributed across the three groups, um, but men tend to be in group one, so strongly left lateralized. Now, already you heard this, so when you asked them to perform the California verbal learning test, which is um, basically learning a shopping list and repeating um, over various choice. Group three, so the more bilateral group outperformed group one and two. If we split this by sex as well, we can see that women in all three groups tend to be better at this task than men, and that's something that we already knew from psychological experiments. Now, the question that came from the study is, so what does this mean when things go wrong? So we recruited uh, stroke patients who had a first ever stroke to the left side of the brain, and we were interested in their right side. So what I'm showing you here is quite a busy slide, but um, we're going to make it work. <laughs> so if you focus on panel B, on the x-axis, you have the size of the arcuate fasciculus, the long segment, in the right hemisphere. And on the y-axis, you can see the recovery after six months. So we did a best on aphasia battery with those patients when they were admitted to hospital and six months after. And without any intervention from our side, we just observed who's getting better and who's not getting better. And I highlighted three patients here for you. So patient one, you can see on the bottom left, has a connection in the right hemisphere, but it's quite a thin connection. The second patient is in the middle of the graph is um, slightly better in terms of recovery after six months and has a slightly stronger connection in the right hemisphere. And then the biggest surprise, to be honest, was patient number three that I highlighted here. And you can see that she is above the blue dotted line. That is the line after which the test um, classifies patients as fully recovered. Now you can see her arcuate uh, on the bottom of the slide, and you can also see her age. So based on clinical um, demographic predictors, no one would have thought that she would be one of the best patients to recover in this entire study. So what you can see here is that by adding neuroimaging and in particular tractography to your clinical assessment, we could boost our prediction of who's going to recover and who will not up to 60%. It's usually around 30%. So this is a huge gain in being able to predict. So this is the, the size of the uh, long segment. Now the other question was like, what? why do we have two more segments? What do they do? Um, 
And one thing I was particularly interested in was conduction aphasia, um, which is when patients are able to articulate, so Broca's area is intact. They're able to understand, so Wernicke's area is intact. But what those patients can't do is repeat. So they can't send what they hear to the frontal lobe to articulate. Um, and classically, the model suggested that this is a disconnection between the two areas. So you have to damage your arcuate fasciculus somewhere. Um, so Broca's and Wernicke's can't talk to each other anymore. But we couldn't see that stroke. I tested all our data, couldn't, couldn't get the answer. So the idea here was that maybe we need to change our model. And that's what we did. So we now looked at neurodegenerative disorders, which has the advantage that you can map the damage of the cortex and the white matter progressively rather than in a sudden onset as stroke. So we mapped the three segments of the arcuate, the long segment, the anterior and the posterior segment, and we looked at the cortical areas that have been shown to be important for language or are connected by the arcuate fasciculus. And we compared healthy controls and um, patients with primary progressive aphasia. Now, when we do that, what we can see is the first panel that looking at the direct connection, the long segment in red, there is no correlation with repetition. When, however, we look at the indirect segment, so the anterior and posterior segments together, there is suddenly a steep correlation between um, the volume of that tract and repetition deficits. When we split the indirect uh, route into the anterior and the posterior, you can see that um, it's driven by the posterior segment, but there's outliers in the anterior segment. So it seems that it's not, it's not as we thought for 150 years, the long direct connection between Broca's and Wernicke's area, but rather the indirect route via the inferior parietal lobe. Looking at the cortical degeneration, um, the only area that survived uh, what is called multiple comparison correction was that turquoise area in the inferior uh, parietal lobe, and that's the area of the supramarginal gyrus. So that nicely goes with the literature in terms of parietal lesions oftentimes causing um, repetition deficits, but we're completely going against the traditional model of the disconnection of the arcuate in terms of the direct long segment. Now, based on this data, we proposed a new model for word repetition, and depending on where the lesion affects the system, either cortically or subcortically, the patient will present with a different flavor of repetition deficits. There's multiple different points where a lesion can occur to cause a repetition deficit. And with that, we are at the take home messages. So what I want you to take away from this talk is that the brain is hugely complex. Um, famous cases can be absolutely fascinating and informative. Um, we have many, many, many different methods and probably will have many more um, to study the brain's architecture and the function of the brain. And the choice of our method and the framework that we choose will change our results. You've seen that the brain can be variable in terms of the gray matter and the white matter, and that this variability matters when we study language and aphasia. You've also seen that current models might need updating. Um, and yeah, we're still mapping the connection anatomy of language in the brain um, for the next couple of years, I guess. <laughs> um, and with that, I said I give you the link. So here it is. Um, it's a YouTube channel called Clinical Neuroanatomy Seminars. And I went through our archive and tried to find all the talks that we have on there that looked into language and aphasia, and there's also what is called the CNS Academy, 
brand new, where um, you find a lot of my conference presentations on those papers that I just presented to you. And with that, thank you. I'm happy to take questions. I love this. This is incredible. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Wow, so my so incredible, incredible. Um, just to tell you, I, me and while you were talking, I have I had private messages with a lot of students like, "You are a rock, she's a rock star," or like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Together, like incredible. And, uh, and yeah, uh, okay. So questions. I I, I know that this, um, a bunch of students really have questions. So yeah, raise your hand. Ariel, Tawi, I'll start calling you. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering because we talk a lot about double dissociation models in this class. And when you're talking about the connection now between um, like Wernicke's area and Broca's area, I don't know if you think like maybe double dissociation is a little like too simplistic for um, language aphasias. I just wanted to know what you thought about that. Very good question indeed. It's not. Um, one of the limitations that the method has, for example, is that we are blind to the direction. So we can't differentiate if the information is traveling from Broca's to Wernicke or from Wernicke's to Broca. Um, what I didn't mention here is that usually um, you always have either a control tract to show that what you described to be a function of that segment or that pathway is actually specific to that connection. Or you have two patients um, and see if they kind of complement each other by looking at the different parts of the network. Um, what we also do a lot is try to validate our tractography findings with other methods. So for example, the model that I showed you about the repetition, I have a video from a neurosurgeon where they actually stimulated during surgery exactly those areas and were able to elicit um, repetition deficits. So yes, no, absolutely. It, it's oftentimes hard to find complementary patients, but every time we find single single cases we're like yes that's we need to we need to study them and test them um so yeah absolutely but not easy to do awesome Tyler, go ahead so you touched on um how the arcuate fascia however you pronounce that sorry is segmented into the long anterior and posterior regions and how the anterior and posterior regions are uh, correlated with conduction aphasia but could you just touch on like the structural differences between the segments and like what areas they connect? Yeah. In terms of the difference, um, you can see the long segment, which is the arcuate sense of stricto, the classical arcuate. That is a direct connection that goes from the inferior frontal gyrus, um, Broca's area often called. Um, and it arches around here, that's the Sylvian fissure. So it arches around it. Arcuate means nothing else other than arching. It's very fancy, but for just, it bends around the Sylvian fissure. And it goes into the temporal lobe here. Now, the classical description is that it stops in the superior temporal gyrus, which is this one. Um, but with tractography and also postmortem Klingler dissection, you usually see it extend further into the um, middle temporal gyrus as well. Now the other two segments um, are the anterior and the posterior segment of the arcuate. The anterior segment, as you can see, doesn't quite reach Broca's area here. It kind of stops in the um, motor cortex and it goes into the inferior parietal. So these two bundles here they connect to the angular and the supramarginal gyrus in the inferior parietal. And then the posterior segment follows the long segment down into the temporal lobe. So that's the, the areas they connect to. Um, they're also easy to segregate when you look at the tractography because the long segment runs more medial in the brain. 
and the um, anterior and posterior segment, they run more lateral, which is a general organization of the brain. The longer the connection, the deeper it usually runs. Thank you for the talk first. It was very, very interesting. Um, I have a question. So with your work on white matter variability, how do you see that working into conversations today about neurodiversity and possibly like reassessing what we actually think a normal brain looks like? Very good question. Um, how much detail? Um, it's, it's hugely, hugely important, I believe. Um, partially because, uh, like bringing it back to language, for example, we know that language therapy after a stroke, for example, helps some patients, but not all patients. But we don't know why. We don't know why. Um, one hypothesis that I had for years and never really had to uh, means to test it is, for example, if music therapy only works in those patients who have an arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere. We don't know yet. It's just a random theory I'm throwing out there. Um, but there's many other methods um, and, and disorders where we have methods that or treatments that help some patients, but not all. And I think part of that difference comes back to us having different brains. And for many, many years, we just didn't really have the methods to study variability in the brain. Um, and that is now possible with more computing power and also more brain data. Um, as it always feels like MRI has been around for ages, but tractography is exactly as old as I am, which is not that old. Uh, <laughs> um, and before that, we didn't really had like imaging methods available. And when you look at post-mortem brains, you need a lot of brains to map variability in a systematic manner. So I think this is quite an exciting timeline because we have the means and a method to um, study variability for the first time. Um, thank you so much for giving this talk. And I'm wondering about actually like conducting uh, research on specific patients, like if you find a patient that has a like symptoms or a specific aphasia that you're particularly interested in, how do you, um, how do you have them participate? Do you have to like pay them a lot to like image their brain in multiple ways and take up their time and like have them do kind of inconvenient things? Well, I usually try to be nice to them and not ask them to do inconvenient things. Um, it, it's a good question though. Um, and it very much depends on uh, where you are and what you want to study and which method you choose to study with. Um, usually patients are very keen to participate in research studies because in the clinic, um, they often don't get as much information as they would like to get simply because of the time constraints in, in a clinical setting. Um, and also if they have aphasias, for example, where they have um, trouble understanding, clinical personnel often doesn't have the time to sit down and just go through it step by step or repeatedly. So they're usually very thankful if you come in and say, hey, I brought eight hours of time for you. I just want to talk to you. Um, but obviously, you need to go through the hoops of having ethical approval because there's a whole um, a whole bunch of things you need to consider in terms of um, capacity when someone can't communicate properly or those um, issues need to be taken care of. Um, and then it also depends on the method. Usually, if you want to take a picture of their brain, so for tractography, for example, Patients go in the scanner and they don't have to do anything. They can't even fall asleep. Um, so it's just unpleasant because it's a tiny tube and it's quite noisy. Um, but a lot of patients just, just fall asleep um, and don't mind. If you try to do something more invasive, um, it takes more persuasion. Um, generally, what we found is the better you prepare the patient, the more easier it is for them to take part and for the MRI study, for example, in the last study, 
um, I got the VR glasses and I had them experience what it is like being in the scanner before we actually put them in. Um, and that greatly helped with um, report. Patients didn't drop out as much. That's awesome. So do you have time for another couple more questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Awesome. So I'm going to read them out loud because we have some mic issues. The first one is, um, if this research is pointing to the importance of connectivity instead of or in addition to structure, so connectivity over structure, how are they incorporating dynamic measurements into their research methodology versus just static measurements of connectivity pathways? The, there has been a big push recently, and I think I, yes. So this isn't necessarily dynamic, but one of the things that Michelle and I have separately worked on recently, um, is that I did a literature review and I went through to see um, which tract is responsible for which function or deficit, vice versa. Um, and one of the things that we found was that actually there isn't that static relationship of one tract, one function, but actually many tracts can be involved in many functions. So that's something we simply haven't systematically studied yet. And then um, another study that Michelle recently did that is now actually published in Nature Comms, and not under review anymore, is that he provided the first functional atlas of the white matter, which is hugely exciting. Um, and people have been trying to do that for as long as I've been in the field. Um, and what he managed to do here is to, uh, as you, hang on, let me zoom in a little bit, so maybe you can see it. So he managed to plot the functions that we got from functional imaging onto different parts of the white matter. So it's hard to see here what this actually is, but he basically sliced through the brain and had a map of the white matter and plotted all the words on it in terms of which part does what. Um, so this isn't dynamic in time, but we're, we're getting there. We're trying to combine new methods with tritography and try to map it in a more dynamic pattern across time and functions. That is fantastic. We actually looked at both these papers last on Monday, actually, not last week, Monday, right. preparation for this, both your and Michelle's paper, absolutely. That's great. Jules, meanwhile, let us know if uh, the answer was, uh, the Torforkel answered your question. And I'm going ahead with the last question from Abby, which is, um, this is more of a general question about language research. Mm -hmm. What do you think of recent efforts to use NLP, ANN, slash DNNs, which I guess is the neural networks, right? To investigate linguistic computations in the brain. Like, do you think going forward that language research is going to tilt more towards computation? Or that there's still a lot of unexplored, or that there's still a lot unexplored with connectivity, localization, and et cetera? And thank you so much for giving this talk. So I guess that the question is about neural networks versus computation versus connectivity, let's say. So I'm, let disclaimer, I'm no expert at all in computational. Um, and I wouldn't, wouldn't dare to say that I have a full understanding of what colleagues in the field are doing. Um, and I'm hugely biased towards connectivity, obviously. Um, so I, I think there is still a lot that we can map with connection and anatomy. Um, there's also an awful lot that we still don't understand. Um, so there is still margin for discoveries in, in connection and anatomy um, in different types of aphasias. Um, I think we will see more and more computational, uh, and that's, that's a great development. Um, but it's also a fancy new tool um, and until we actually know what to do with it, those more traditional 
methods that have been around for longer will still have their use. Um, we've kind of seen that with chartography. When it first came about, I was like, whoa, exciting, very pretty pictures, let's do everything with it. Um, and that was still when I was doing my PhD, for example, it was like the method, everyone had to do chartography. Nowadays, people are slightly more reserved because the field has learned what the limitations are. Um, and some of these limitations you can compromise on, some of them you can't, depending on what you study. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I think there will be many exciting things that we can learn from it. Um, but generally, the field is moving towards multimodal and more integration of all the different methods that we have. So we'll see if some methods develop independently or if we actually manage to bring it all together. Because I think most of the methods, as I've shown you in the beginning, they are complementary. So if I go back to this slide and this slide, you see that each method can give you something else, either a better resolution or a better time resolution. Um, so the trick is really to get the best of both worlds and bring it together. All right, that was fantastic. Uh, Thomas, do you, have a, do you have another minute for one last question? Sure. Hi, Dr. Corkle. Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to ask a really specific niche question, uh, but you seem to be the language expert. So I'm going to ask you. It's been on my mind for a long time. So I love rap. And the music rap, and I specifically am really interested in uh, people's ability to freestyle. And I've always been interested, you know, some people have this ability to, on the spot, come up with these dynamic, novel abilities to communicate ideas through language. And I've always just wondered, is there any research? I mean, could this perhaps be that very ability you were talking about? This ability to express on the spot? I don't know, just do you know, any, is there any research? Do you know anything about that? Could you maybe have any insight into that ability? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I love the question. <laughs> there, I, I never actually pointed anyone to that talk, but there is a talk I gave many, many years ago that ended up on YouTube um, where I teamed up with two rappers. Mm -hmm. um, it was a public engagement talk, and they taught the audience how to do freestyle rap. Um, and then I had um, a link to language whereby someone actually read in an MRI scanner. So I showed the areas of the brain that are um, involved. Um, that's anecdotal, obviously. <laughs> so okay. it's, it's quite interesting to get that, that connection. Um, I'm sure someone tried to look at it. Uh, I'm not aware of any proper scientific studies. Gotcha. Um, but have a look, just pop it, see what you find. Gotcha. Okay, thank you very much. And as I said, a lot of time students, of course, always come up with just super cool ideas and we are all so much in our own small laboratory that then it's like, oh, why we even think about it? So the, the way I answer this type of question is, Thomas, that's your research project. So that's what you're gonna work next, right? Clearly, you have a scientific question, then you have the connection. Dr. Forkel is here immediately. Look for literature, start reading, and uh, every time you have one of these, you know, kind of ideas, that all of them are worth, you know, at least look in the literature if there's, you know, something already that has been done. If not, bingo, that's the jackpot. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for uh, guests lecturing us. This was incredible. Uh, I personally thank love you. it. Again, the chat is clearly saying that everybody loved it. We hope to see you soon again back to our class and uh, we will read more Neopool stuff for sure 2020, 2021. All right? <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the question. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye. All right, just to getting back to the usual stuff, I know, but a few seconds, I'm sure you loved it. Um, just one thing that I wanted to, to show you today uh, before um, um, Monday's exam, 